Hey, Baileys. Good morning. Good morning, friends. Uh, welcome to worship at Harrisburg United Methodist Church. It is good to be uh, together this morning. As we are preparing for worship, we welcome you those who are online, and we welcome those who are in the room. For those of you who are online and um, have not met us yet, my name is Tony Ruth, and this is my husband, Wes. We are uh, the co-pastors here at Harrisburg United Methodist Church. We have been for the last 10 years, and we will be for another year. So uh, there's, our, there's your announcement that your clergy are sticking around uh, for another year. So we are uh, delighted to be here for that. Um, we're going to invite you, as soon as we can get, we're working on getting this, the screen pulled up, um, but we're going to invite you to stand wherever you are, and um, let's prepare our hearts and our minds um, for worship this morning. Gracious and loving God, for your mercies and your love and your goodness, we are so grateful this morning for your provision and the abundance of what you offer us. We pray that you would lift our eyes to see what you have provided and to give thanks with all that we are for the beauty of your creation and the truth of a life in you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to lift our eyes to see that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Let's sing together.
strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we should not fear. No matter what should come our way. That is why we sing. It's why we talk about leaning on God's everlasting arms. And it's why we sing and we come to worship and we remember that God has lifted us up every time we felt like we were falling down and that we couldn't do it anymore on our own. So in gratitude for all the ways that God has done that for you, let us continue our worship as we sing Love Lifted Me. two officers that were um, fatally shot in uh, 
uh, an incident, um, a, a domestic incident in Boone and down east um, with the family of, of Andrew Brown. And we are just aware that there is, you know, it comes to your front door too. Um, so we want to be keeping in prayer the families of the officers who were um, murdered this week, um, as well as the family of Andrew Brown and all the law enforcement down east as they are trying to determine what happened and why it happened and um, what we can do moving forward. Um, we invite you to be in a spirit of prayer with us as we go to the Lord together. Risen Savior, it feels sometimes as though death might actually have the final victory. It felt like it to the disciples on Holy Saturday when they grieved and mourned your crucifixion, not knowing what we know now. It felt like it to Mary and Martha when Lazarus lay in the tomb. Again and again throughout history, it has felt like death was going to have the final say. And yet every Sunday you call us to worship. Every day you call us to wake and worship. And remember resurrection promise. Remember that there is always hope. Remember that you have fought the forces of death and destruction and evil in this world. And that you are victorious. And while it may sometimes seem, Lord, like death wins, you are always calling us to remember who we worship and that you rose again on the third day and that you have promised that the victory, the final victory, is in your hands and it is assured. So it is in that absolute hope that we lift up to you the families of those officers that were lost this week in Boone and the families and friends of the people that were killed. And we ask God for healing in that community, for comfort and peace to husbands and wives who have lost someone that they love and to children who have lost their parent. We ask God that you would be at work even now redeeming these losses and bringing life out of death. We equally, Lord, think of the family of Andrew Brown and all those, Lord, who feel like their lives have been lost in unjust ways. Lord, we are confused and we don't know all the answers, but we know, God, we can see that our communities are hurting and broken and that we need another answer. And so we pray for it. We ask for it. We beg for another answer. Pray for a better way. For you to show us what it means to live as people who are always calling others to remember resurrection hope. That people can change. That situations can be transformed, that what is does not always have to be, that the power of sin has been broken by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray for a better way, for a more holy way, for a more righteous way. And we pray that you would teach us and give us the courage to walk in it. We ask, Lord Jesus, for this broken world that we love, that you love, that you called good, that you love so much that you're willing to come and walk upon our sod and live with us and love with us. We pray for this world that we love and we pray, God, that you would redeem her and that the promise of your victory will be true and that we would know it and that we would live differently because of it. Lord, we lift up those situations that we have promised our prayers to in the week that has been. For the places where people are sick or hurting or grieving or alone or lost or afraid, we pray. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers and thank you for your provision 
in all things. Thank you for love that is bigger and deeper and wider than we can imagine. Thank you for forgiveness that we need so desperately. Thank you for second chances and new life, for bringing messages of light into our lives when we need it most. Thank you for using our hands and feet to build up your kingdom in this world. Thank you, God, that you have and you are redeeming even us. Pray that you would make us faithful to the call. It is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Am I good? Am I on? Hello, good morning. Morning. Ordinarily, well, is it, is it too long to ask people to stand up? No, it's not. I'm going to have you stand up for the reading of the gospel. The, uh, the original text that we had written down uh, was John 11. And Shirley popped her head in my office and she said, are you preaching a sermon? I said, yeah. She said, and you're reading all of John 11? I said, oh, no, no. Uh, just most of it. Uh, go back one. We're going to pray before we start. Um, we're going to say together the prayer for illumination. So let us pray. Open for us, O God, the words of the witnesses received by the faithful and handed on to us. Make us free to hear and not hold back, that we may live in the joy of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, who calls us by our name. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Alleluia. Amen. So we are going to be reading John chapter 11, verses 17 through 44. Um, fairly famous uh, event here. <clears throat> when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. Now Jesus has heard about that Lazarus was sick and dying, and he waited. Um, he delayed, and so that's the reason for the conversation we're getting ready to hear. <clears throat> when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told, him privately, told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. 
Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Then Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for all people. You may be seated. Let us pray. We thank you for the gift of your word, God, and for your wisdom, truth, and love that you share with us as the Holy Spirit inspires our reading and hearing. And now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My cousin Amy, who I love deeply, was diagnosed with cancer three years ago. And one thing you need to know about Amy, Amy was the oldest on my dad's side of my generation. We were a small family. But Amy was the oldest. Um, I believe she was like nine years old, ten years old when I was born. And uh, I was, I know this is a shock to many of you, an annoying kid. Um, and uh, got on most everybody's nerves. Uh, but Amy was unfailingly kind to me and patient. We connected uh, through... Um, our whole life together in, in our family, Amy and I connected, and um, it was a joy to talk to her. I didn't see her nearly enough over the past 20 years or so, but y'all know how that goes. Your life moves in different directions. Uh, but Amy was diagnosed with cancer three years ago. After an initial round of treatments, the cancer went into remission. But last fall came back with a vengeance. And there was a pretty rapid decline over the last few months, and she was placed in hospice care last weekend. Now, this past Monday, I started doing the research for this sermon, reading and reflecting on the story of Jesus raising Lazarus, thinking about how to connect that back to our theme of lifting our eyes, lifting our heads. I didn't connect that story with Amy's illness. You know, people go into hospice care, some of you experience this. It could be days, weeks, who knows? My sister and I, on Tuesday, went to visit Amy about a three-hour drive uh, in Littleton up near the Virginia State Line up north of Durham, Durham. We went to visit Amy and my aunt and uncle and uh, my other cousin Lori, Amy's um, younger sister, who has poured out her life uh, these past three years taking care of Amy. Um, we stayed there for a little over an hour and a half and sat with Amy and I prayed with her. And then we made our drive back home. We were about five minutes from my sister's house in Landis when we got the call that Amy had died. I suddenly remembered as we were driving to our parents, mine and Christy's parents, or my parents' house, I suddenly remembered that I was going to be preaching about Jesus and Lazarus. And you might think, uh, well, that must have given you hope. No, I was angry. I was angry that I had to preach about Lazarus. I didn't want to preach about Lazarus. In fact, I didn't want to preach at all. I wanted to rewind the clock about 35 years. Without even being aware of it, I found myself having the same visceral response that both Mary and Martha had when Jesus showed up after being delayed. Or we could say that Jesus hemmed and hauled or lollygagged. Just pick a southernism, whatever Jesus did. Jesus, if you had been there, why did this happen? 
Why, Amy? Where were you? And then I spent a lot of time on Wednesday avoiding the work I needed to do to prepare for this sermon. And when I did turn my attention to sermon prep, I was irritable and edgy. Not the ideal frame of mind for sermon writing. So yeah, I can relate to Martha. Before Jesus raises Lazarus, before that last little part of that story, this is a story about grief. And it's in your face. Mourning, lament, grief, tears. Not the quiet, polite, dignified kind of grief. You know, the respectable kind of grief, whatever that is. But loud, screaming, uncomfortable, uncontrolled, falling to the ground with tears and snot running down your face. Ugly, crying kind of grief. That's the scene in Bethany. A lot of us aren't used to that. It makes us uncomfortable. We work, to, we work hard to hide that kind of grief or to explain it away, to get a hold of ourselves or to tell friends and family, yeah, get, a, get control of yourself. Just calm down. We want to shush and stifle and distract and deny that kind of grief. But it's all right there in John's story. And Jesus doesn't scold. He doesn't shh. A few years ago, our theology small group read the outstanding and challenging book, The Slavery of Death, by psychologist and theologian Richard Beck. He wrote the following about our compulsive need to avoid and deny death as well as grief he says vast portions of American Christianity are aimed at propping up the illusion of death avoidance we see this in the triumphalism within many sectors of Christianity the almost manic optimism of church culture that cannot admit any hint of debility disease death or decay these churches are filled with smiling, cheerful people who respond with fine to any inquiry regarding their social, financial, emotional, physical, or spiritual well-being. We ask each other how we're doing and what do we say? Fine. Beck says we avoid admitting our weakness, our failures, our pain, and our grief because they threaten to expose the neurotic lie that sits at the heart of Christian culture in American society that death doesn't exist. And so when we see Mary and Martha and their, their grief, their real pain, we want to look down. We want to look away from Mary and from Martha. We want to avoid grief, our own grief and the grief of others. And that leaves us, really, with a shallow faith that really isn't Faith, but manic optimism. Now, the true opposite of that shallow, desperate optimism isn't gloomy pessimism. That's fake, too. That's also a defense mechanism. Oh, none of it matters. Nothing matters. That's another way of avoiding. The true opposite of that shallow, uh, desperate optimism is love. Deep, authentic real love. You know, that's the flip side of the coin of grief. We grieve deeply because we love deeply. And I'm talking about real love, not sentimentality. This love is sacrificial. Immediately after raising Lazarus, the Pharisees and the priests begin working explicitly to kill Jesus. Up to this point, they've, they've been annoyed by him. They've been looking for ways to trap him or trip him up. But now they begin turning their hostility into actual plans. Jesus' act of love and raising Lazarus 
is of course a preview of the resurrection, but it also sets in motion the plot that will lead to his death. Jesus knows this. It's sacrificial love. And really almost more than any story in the Gospels, we see that sacrificial love, but we also see Jesus' humanity in this story. His grief, his tears, his love. He is with us in our grief and our suffering. Tuesday morning when I held Amy's hand and we prayed with her, Jesus was in that room with us. He's with us in a real sense in the midst of our grief and pain in the presence of the Holy Spirit. But he's also with us in the sense that he too experienced grief and sadness and pain. He knows what it is to hurt. And so there's a glimmer of hope in our grief. God is with us. Jesus knows our sorrows and helps us to remember that death and grief, these aren't the final things. These aren't the last things. Death and grief and loss and pain are not the end. They are not eternal. Paul puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4. We do not grieve as those who have no hope. Now Paul isn't saying that we don't grieve at all. He's acknowledging we grieve, but even in our grief we are not hopeless. Our grief does not give way to despair. It's tinged with hope. Hope of resurrection. Hope that God holds all things, including our lives and the lives of those we love, in His hands. Hope that God's grace and love are more powerful than death. Jesus embraces and cries and listens when He gets to Bethany. He's sad for His friends and for Lazarus. Before he commands Lazarus to come out of the tomb, he looks up and lifts his head to pray. He's teaching us how to grieve and how to be with one another in our grief. Embrace, cry, listen, look up and pray. Trust in God's power. The reality of God's love and power does not minimize or negate or deny our grief. As I said, Jesus doesn't scold Mary and Martha. He grieves with them just as he grieves with us. Jesus lifts his head, looks to God, and sets the example for us. I'm deeply sad about my cousin. I love Amy. And writing this sermon hasn't cleared that up. I'm about this, I'm not fine, but I'm not angry. I'm grieving, but I'm not despairing. I'm hurting, but I have hope. Jesus is with us. He shares our pain and our grief and offers us life and hope. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, we lift our heads and we look to Jesus. And we see life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, thank you all for loving our family this week. We really appreciate it. As we think about the power of God to do amazing things, we are inviting um, Tim Prentice, who is our lay leader, to come and share a word with you. Good morning. morning. It'll be more than one word. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, there, you go. Oh, there we go. So it's been about 15 months, I think, since the last time I stood before everyone and talked about the building. Um, I know that because I came across a presentation that I had saved on my computer, um, which was helpful in uh, preparing for this. So I wanted to give you an update about our overflowing campaign as well as where we are with our uh, building and the, the loan associated with that. 
So first off, I wanted to share this amazing news about our overflowing campaign. As you can see, we've received 81% of the total pledges that were made for our building campaign, which is phenomenal. Um, you know, we're, we're just now two thirds. In fact, this would be the two year anniversary of the start of when we started receiving gifts for overflowing. So the fact that we're more than 80% there and you know, we still have another whole year to go is, is fantastic. Um, so I wanted to share that good news and that's all because of the, the faithfulness of every one of you. I mean, that's, that's why we're there. We've also received some non-pledged funds. Um, you can see about $16,000 that have just come in as gifts that people have made designated to overflowing but never actually made a pledge. Um, we've also received a $50,000 grant from the Cannon Foundation um, that went towards the ADA restrooms that we created near the Fellowship Hall. Um, another thing that we received is the church was named a beneficiary of a life insurance policy from a member that passed away recently. Uh, we haven't yet received those funds, but we expect to receive them shortly. And then we also expect to receive about $26,000 um, in sales tax rebates. So as a nonprofit, we don't actually have to pay sales tax. So all the sales tax we paid for materials for the building, we get back from the state. So a little bit about um, the construction and the loan information. So um, back in January of 2020, uh, the church voted to approve us to move forward with our building with a budget of just under $1.8 million. Um, that was what we had estimated at the time um, that it was going to cost to do the entire thing. I'm pleased to report that we spent about $47,000 less than that. And so our actual spend, as you can see, is about 1.728. So where does that put us? We have a loan with the United Methodist Foundation. Um, it's a 15 year loan with a, currently it's a 3% rate, but that is a variable rate and can change um, quarterly as the foundation meets and interest rates change. But we have been told that for now, that rate is locked until at least the, through the end of 2023. So we know that for at least 18 months, we're going to be at that 3%. Whoop. Man, that thing went all of a sudden. So our initial loan balance is a total of $744,000 and change. That's taken every bit of money that we have at now and putting it down against the the money that we borrowed from the foundation for our construction loan um, that will result in a monthly payment of just over fifty one hundred dollars a month and again that um, can adjust as we move through the process the finance committee has met uh, over the past few months to discuss about paying back our loan and we've developed a fairly robust plan for balancing paying down the principal as quickly as we can with also retaining some funds in case we have cash flow issues in the future. So we are looking to be as aggressive as makes sense to pay that balance down so that it's not 15 years that we're paying on this loan, it's, it's less than that. So looking ahead. So again, like I said, our, our goal in the short term and longer term is to reduce the loan principal as much as we can to get the loan paid off quickly to save as much on interest as possible. So that we ask that for your continued faithfulness, right? We're 81% of the way there on our overflowing pledges and you know we still have a little ways to go and that money will all go towards paying down the principal faster so that when our overflowing campaign is completed, we are able to make the monthly mortgage payments through our normal operating budget. And we'd also ask for anyone, if you feel so moved, to consider continuing your contributions dedicated to the overflowing campaign. Um, as you can see, we do have a little ways to go, um, and we'd like to do more here, right? But we're not going to do more until, you know, we can pay off the first part, right? We don't want to overextend ourselves any more than necessary. So if you've completed your pledge, first of all, thank you very much for that. 
And second of all, if you want to consider either continuing that pledge at the amount you pledge or even a, a lesser amount, um, you know, that will go a long way towards helping us pay down this debt and move to the next faithful step in our process. So thank you. You know, uh, we, uh, when we started this project, we, voted, we made that vote in January, and nobody could have predicted what was getting ready to happen. In January, not one of us could have imagined that we would have had a whole year that we weren't worshiping in this building. Um, but God has been faithful all along the way. As we look back on this whole project, there is not one moment that God has not been in it. Not in one vote, not in one plan, not in one conversation, not in one budget meeting, not at any point has God not been in this. And so we know that God is going to provide, and we're thankful to you all for that um, and to the faithfulness of our congregation. So we do uh, challenge you to continue your giving to the overflowing campaign. Um, what amazing things we can do when we do it together. In uh, thanksgiving for all of that, let's pray. Lord, for your provision and for your goodness and your mercies, we are so very grateful. And we ask, Lord, that you will continue to provide for us in every way and to help us to know that everything that you have put in our hands is for the purpose of life that is abundant, not just for us, but for everyone. So we pray that you would make us wise in our use of our funds for ourselves, but that you would also make us generous in our giving to others, to the work of ministry and to the building up of your kingdom. We are deeply grateful for your love and for your provision, and we pray that you would bless every gift to the glory of God and the building up of the kingdom. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I would remind you, you can give to the building fund or to the offering online. The link to that is in, for those of you who are online, um, in the comments section. You can find that also on our website under Give. And you can, on the drop-down menu, choose any one of those places to give. The overflowing campaign um, is the building project. And then the regular offering is just our regular offering. I want to invite you to stand as you are able. Friends, we remember today that we dwell in the house of God. And we don't have a reason to be afraid even though we may grieve. So let's sing together.
So, um, just a second. Oh, he doesn't have a mic on. Well, never mind. Follow me, camera. <laughs> um, friends, it is uh, uh, just a joy to remember that we get to be in ministry together. So I'm going to invite you to look for ways that you can engage in the life of ministry and do the beautiful work of remembering God's faithfulness and God's goodness and His mercies that are for us every day and everywhere. And now, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well...